to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Welcome to session one of the Bait of Satan, and uh, I'm so excited about this. You know, it's an over 20-year-old message. It has we've literally seen millions of people ministered to by it, thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably liberated from a fence. And for those of you that have never heard this message, um, this will probably be one of the greatest confrontations with truth that you're ever going to experience. Um, offense, the bait of Satan, is probably one of the most difficult obstacles to overcome, but it can be overcome by the grace of God and through the love of God. And so that's what we're going to dive into in these next six sessions. Your life is going to be transformed. There has been so much prayer, so much believing that we are telling you right now, get ready for the Holy Spirit to do a great work in your life. Now, uh, the disciples of Jesus, I think this is the best way to really open it up. The disciples of Jesus saw probably the most amazing, well, not probably, they saw the most amazing miracles that any generation has ever seen. I mean, can you imagine them personally witnessing people being raised from the dead, yeah. totally blind eyes being opened, people not ever walking in their life and suddenly jumping up and walking. I mean, storms that are life-threatening, that, e that which would even scare professional fishermen. He wa they watched him calm them in a moment. I mean, these are amazing miracles, but yet it wasn't these miracles that pushed them to the brink of doubt. It was actually what would happen at the latter part of Jesus's three and a half year ministry when he looked at his disciples and made this statement, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day, in a day, did you see that? And seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent you shall forgive him. Watch the disciples response when he says that. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. It is amazing to me. It wasn't the miracles of people being raised from the dead. It was the simple fact that Jesus said, forgive your brother when he sins against you multiple times that brought them to the brink of saying, God, you've got to increase our faith. So let's talk about our day today. Could today even be more important, these words of Jesus, be more important today than even in the days of the apostles? Well, I'm going to tell you right now in advance, they are more applicable to today than even the days of the apostles. So I want to talk about today. Today is the time period when Jesus said it would be just before he returns. How many of you believe we're living in that day, right before the second coming of Christ? I mean, Jesus said we would recognize the season, but we wouldn't know the day or the hour, correct? So... Jesus told his disciples many, many things that would happen right before he returned. And I want to zero in in Matthew chapter 24 around the 10th verse. Jesus says here, he says, and then many. Now, the Greek word there for many is the Greek word polis, all right? It means many, much of number, quantity, or amount. Some of the dictionaries that I examined say it means mostly or majority. So Jesus Immediately, we know he's talking about at least 51% of the people. Now, I have traveled all over the world and I've preached on this. And can I tell you, I have never once seen in any conference or church less than 50% of the people respond to being offended at the end of a message. And many of them didn't realize they were offended until the word of God exposed it. And then many will be offended. Everybody say offended. offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Now, this is a progression. An offended person will eventually betray. 
And if a betrayal is not dealt with, it can ultimately lead to hatred. You say, John, where do you get that? Well, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19 says, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Now, in the days of Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs, what did strong cities have around them? Walls. walls. What were walls built for? Protection. They would keep out those people that you believed were against you, and they would permit people in that you believed were for you. This is exactly what happens to a man or a woman when they become offended. They begin to build walls. Now, the New Testament doesn't call them walls. The New Testament calls them strongholds. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare... Now, everybody, please understand this. We are not in a playground. We are in a battleground. And it is good that we view life that way. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. strongholds. What are those strongholds? He goes on to say, casting down arguments, and a better rendition would be imaginations or reasonings, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. These strongholds, what they are, are they are set patterns of reasoning through which we process information. Now, we are basically are told by the word of God to love one another. And the love of God always focuses on giving, giving, giving. A person who has been offended starts building reasoning processes deep within their soul that processes all the information comes in. And so now what happens is they start developing these reasoning processes to protect, to protect, to protect. Now the focus is no longer to give, it's now I gotta protect myself. And this happens deep in the soul, okay? And so what happens is this makes us a perfect candidate for betrayal. Now. Many Christians really don't understand betrayal, and I should say many people, because they think of extreme cases. They think of Benedict Arnold, or they think of Judas Iscariot. However, a betrayal is simply this. A betrayal is when I seek my benefit or my protection at the expense of one I have a relationship with. Now, when your focus is to protect, to protect, to protect, that makes you a candidate for betrayal. Now I'm going to protect myself at the expense of even one I've got a covenant relationship with. A betrayal is the ultimate abandonment of a relationship. Let me, let me, let me tell you what happens in a betrayal. In a betrayal, the love of God in our heart begins to grow cold. Because why? Because we're not giving. If you look, there are two seas in Israel. There's two major seas. There's the Sea of Galilee and there's the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee receives waters freely from the north that originate up in the mountains near Caesarea Philippi, and it freely gives out in the south. It comes down the Jordan River to the south into the Dead Sea. So the Sea of Galilee freely receives, and it freely gives. The Sea of Galilee is loaded with life. But the same living waters go down the Jordan River and enter into the northern part of the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea only takes in. It doesn't give out. The Dead Sea, nothing can live in it. Absolutely nothing can live. So an offended Christian, here, here's the love of God coming in, but now the walls are built. I'm protecting. The love begins to dry cold. So now the focus becomes self, makes you a perfect candidate of betrayal. And a betrayal, as I said, is the ultimate abandonment of a relationship. And if it's not dealt with, a betrayal can even lead to hatred. Now, a lot of Christians don't understand hatred. They, they attach extreme emotional anger or frustration with hatred. You can have hatred and not have any emotions attached to it. If you look at Absalom, he hated his brother Ammon. And the Bible says he neither spoke good nor evil to him. If you look at what John the Apostle writes, he says whoever hates his brother, so he's writing to Christians, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, if you look at the word hate here, it is the Greek word misio. And the literal definition of that is to love less. Now, I'm going to tell you what it really means. It's a vacuum, void of love. 
So in other words, when a person hates, doesn't necessarily mean they're really angry. Somebody can be angry and really still love and care about somebody. It means they have no love at all left in their heart for that person. A betrayal can lead to hatred. And as John says, you hate your brother, you're a murderer, and don't even think you've got eternal life abiding in you. And then Jesus goes on to say in the very next verse, then, what's he mean by then? After there's massive offense, betrayals from the offense, and even hatred resulting from the betrayals, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now, who are the many they're going to deceive? The many that are offended, which tells me something that an offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. Now, what does Jesus call false prophets in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15? He calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, notice he doesn't say they are wolves in shepherd's clothing, correct? All right, everybody's always looking for the false prophet behind the pulpit. I got news for you, in 30 years of ministry and traveling all over the world, being in many, many churches, I have discovered there are more false prophets in the pews than there are in the pulpits. Good preaching, John, amen. Now, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, I personally love watching programs about animals, okay? Discovery Channel, it's the bomb, okay? My family actually got me for my birthday, Planet Earth, because I love animals, right? So I discovered something about these, these, um, these predators, okay? Like wolves and hyenas, and they, they travel in packs. And you know what the goal of the wolf pack is? To isolate the sheep from the herd. And you know what sheep they usually try to isolate? Is the wounded sheep, the offended sheep. Okay, because if they can isolate the sheep from the herd, the sheep is meat for their table. Do you or someone you know speak a language other than English? Do you want more inspired teaching from John and Lisa Bevere? Go on to cloudlibrary.org, free video streaming and resource download website. Select your language. Select your resource from the extensive library. Ebooks video messages, audio books and teaching, TV shows, Bibles, and more. Learn more. Go to cloudlibrary.org. The Sea of Galilee freely receives and it freely gives. The Sea of Galilee is loaded with life. But the same living waters go down the Jordan River and enter into the northern part of the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea only takes in. It doesn't give out. The Dead Sea, nothing can live in it. Absolutely nothing can live. So an offended Christian, here, here's the love of God coming in, but now the walls are built. I'm protecting. The love begins to dry cold. So now the focus becomes self, makes you a perfect candidate of betrayal. And a betrayal, as I said, is the ultimate abandonment of a relationship. And if it's not dealt with, a betrayal can even lead to hatred. Now, a lot of Christians don't understand hatred. They, they attach extreme emotional anger or frustration with hatred. You can have hatred and not have any emotions attached to it. If you look at Absalom, he hated his brother Ammon. And the Bible says he neither spoke good nor evil to him. If you look at what John the Apostle writes, he says whoever hates his brother, so he's writing to Christians, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, if you look at the word hate here, it is the Greek word misio. And the literal definition of that is to love less. Now, I'm going to tell you what it really means. It's a vacuum, void of love. So in other words, when a person hates, doesn't necessarily mean they're really angry. Somebody can be angry and really still love and care about somebody. It means they have no love at all left in their heart for that person. A betrayal can lead to hatred. And as John says, you hate your brother, you're a murderer and don't even think you've got eternal life abiding in you. And then Jesus goes on to say in the very next verse, then, what's he mean by then? After there's massive offense, betrayals from the offense and even hatred resulting from the betrayals, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now, who are the many they're going to deceive? The many that are offended, 
which tells me something that an offended heart is the breeding ground of deception. Now, what does Jesus call false prophets in Matthew chapter, chapter 7, verse 15? He calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, notice he doesn't say they are wolves in shepherd's clothing. Correct? Yes. All right. Everybody's always looking for the false prophet behind the pulpit. I got news for you. In 30 years of ministry and traveling all over the world, being in many, many churches, I have discovered there are more false prophets in the pews than there are in the pulpits. Good preaching, John. Amen. Now, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, I personally love watching programs about animals, okay? Discovery Channel, it's the bomb, okay? My family actually got me for my birthday, Planet Earth, because I love animals, right? So I've discovered something about these, these, um, these predators, okay? Like wolves and hyenas, and they, they travel in packs, and you know what the goal of the wolf pack is? To isolate the sheep from the herd. And you know what sheep they usually try to isolate? Is the wounded sheep, the offended sheep, okay? Because if they can isolate the sheep from the herd, the sheep is meat for their table. <laughs> Proverbs 18 verse one says this, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. Now, the scary thing is you can be a part of a big church, you can be a part of a big family, but the isolation occurs in the soul. The thought processes, the reasonings that have been set up, the set patterns of reasoning. That isolation occurs. When that does, you can still be a member of a big family, big church. Now you're what? You're the target of these wolves. Are you with me? Then Jesus goes on to say, and because lawlessness will abound. Now, what is the word lawlessness? The word lawlessness is the Greek word anomia, which simply means this, not sub being submitted to the authority of God. Just simply means not submitted to his word. All right? Lawlessness is going to abound. What's he talking about? The lawless thinking. You see, the thought processes that are contrary to the knowledge of God. You know, we set up these walls, these strongholds, once we're hurt, and we think that they're going to protect us, but they actually torment us. And they act because why? They are contrary to the knowledge of God, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So, because lawlessness will abound, that's the lawless thinking and lawless actions both that result from the offense, the love of many will grow cold. Now, I think we would all agree in today's hour that lawlessness abounds in our society. Yes. I mean, there is a lot of tensions in our society that I could speak to right now, right? There's lawlessness resulting from it. But you know what's amazing to me? Jesus isn't talking about society. Now remember, he's isolating the days right before he returns. He is actually talking about inside the church. Now you say, John, now wait a minute. How do you know that he's talking about inside the church? Well, if you look at the word love, there is the Greek word agape. There are two major Greek words used for love. They're both translated love in the New Testament, agape and phileo. Phileo is affectionate love. That is the love that even the world has. Agape is the love that lays down its life for its neighbor. It's the love that loves even if it's not returned. That is the love that Jesus said the world cannot receive. That is the love that the Bible says is shed abroad in Romans chapter 8, it's, or Romans chapter 5, it's shed abroad in our heart. So we know he's not talking about the world because of the word that he uses here. I'm going to tell you the second reason I know that he's not talking about the world. Because look what he says in the very next verse. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. You don't look and an unbeliever and say, if you endure, you're going to be saved. You look at somebody that has already started the race and say, if you endure, you're going to be saved. So Jesus is saying in the last days, there's going to be massive offense. Okay. And this massive offense is going to lead to betrayals. I mean, if you look at the bloodiest wars in our history, it happens with people that are close. So massive offense is going to occur, and I'm going to show you it's mostly with people that are close to each other. It's going to lead to betrayals, which even leads to hatred. Deception's going to result from it. 
because of the lawless thinking from the thoughts that are contrary to the knowledge of God, many, the love of many, that's the same Greek word police, is going to grow cold. Now, the way he uses this word is it's going to grow cold like the frog in the kettle in reverse. You know, you put the frog in the kettle and you turn on the heat, he's not going to jump out. You put him in boiling water, he's going to jump out if he can't. This is the frog in the kettle scenario in reverse. It grows cold. And I'm going to tell you something. I walked through this, and I didn't recognize the love of God in my heart growing cold. I saw the effects of it, and God was merciful and opened up my eyes. That's why I'm so passionate about this message. And so the person that can hurt you the deepest, as I just said, is the person that's closest to you. David said it like this. It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who have so arrogantly insulted me. I could have hidden from them. We expect our enemy, the world, to hurt us. But David said this. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion, and close friend. What good fellowship we once enjoyed as we walked together in the house of God. The closer the relationship, the greater the potential offense. Why is that? Because our expectations are higher. See, if I look at an, 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 you know, an average Christian, they expect the world to mistreat them. They're prepared for the world to mistreat them. Why? Because the world doesn't have the love of God in them. So our expectations on the world, let's say this is ground zero, all right, this table. Their expectations is zero, okay? But now our expectations on our Christian, brother, Christian brothers and sisters are about here. And our expectation on our pastors are about here. And our expectation on our husband or wife is about there. Okay, so now if the world does that much for us, they've been that much of a blessing because our expectation was zero. But if a Christian brother only does that, they've offended us by this much. When our pastor d does that much, he's offended me by this much. So while, no, no, what, what's happening here? The potential of the offense now goes up. When our spouse only does that, oh my goodness, massive offense. That's why over 50% of marriages end up in divorce court because our expectations. We didn't sign up to serve. We signed up to be served when we got married. But yet Jesus said, if you want to be a leader like me, remember the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Jesus got down and became the base servant and washed his disciples' feet and he said, I've left you an example. You call me Lord and King. I'm your leader, but I am here among you as one who serves. He took that place of the lowest servant in the house, the one who washed the people's feet when they came off the street where you had the horse manure, the horse pee, all that other stuff because they didn't have cars back then. They didn't have night tennis shoes. Jesus said, I'm going to be the lowest servant in the house here and I'm going to wash your feet. He was illustrating to us that he said, I'm the chief servant. Yeah. So when you think about a husband, a husband signs up to be the chief servant of the family if he's the head of the home. It doesn't change the dynamic of authority, but it radically uh, changes the way it's administered. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. And so, so in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus says, it is impossible. Look at the word impossible. Now, if Jesus says impossible, do you think... <laughs> Okay, it is impossible that no offenses should come. What's he saying? He's saying if you breathe air, you are going to have the opportunity to be offended. But what you do with the offense is going to determine your future. You're either going to become stronger or you're going to become bitter, right? Now, the Greek word for offense there is the Greek word scandalon. Scandalon is an, actually an ancient Greek word that was originally used to describe the bait stick or trigger of a trap that hunters would use to catch small animals and birds in. The hunter would place the bait on the trigger, the scandalon, and the animal would take that bait and the trap would close and either capture or kill the animal. Thereby, an offense is the bait of Satan to pull you and I, the believer, into his captivity. 
That's heavy. I want to show you what the complete word study dictionary says about this word. Scandalon always denotes an enticement to conduct which could ruin the person in question. Remember the book of Hebrews says, looking carefully, right? Lest any root of bitterness springs up, causing defilement, ruining. Defile means ruining a person. Do you see how dangerous offense is? Scary thing is most people that are offended don't even realize they're offended. Paul confirms this trap when he writes to Timothy. Look what he says to him. He said, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, must not be in strife, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, offended with one another. Do you see this? If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may acknowledge the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare, the word snare means trap, escape the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by the devil to do the devil's will. You know, the scary thing is you can still be a minister of the gospel, you can still serve on a ministry team, you can still be tending a home group every week, tending church every time the doors open, even witnessing to people, but you're trapped. You're captive of Satan. Now you think you're releasing rivers of living water when in reality you're releasing rivers tainted with bitterness. Amen. I firmly believe that the enemy is going to raise up an army against the church to fight against us in these next several years. I believe because the greatest move of the Spirit of God on earth is, that has ever been witnessed is about to happen. And I believe that army is going to be raised up. And you know that army is not going to be propelled by merely the world. It's going to be a, propelled by Christians that have been taken captive and are now unknowingly entrapped and releasing bitterness instead of propelling the glorious gospel of Jesus in a unified way as a family should. The bait of Satan is a very serious issue. It's not something to take lightly. As I said, it's probably the greatest confrontation of truth that you're going to encounter as a Christian other than being saved. And so I'm so happy that you are part of this class as we journey together to become completely free from any kind of offense, to be completely free from the trap, from the bait that Satan lays for us.